Welcome to St. George's 2021 Black Litany of Saints, a celebration of Black History Month. Brought to you on behalf of the Music and Arts Committee and Program Organizers in St. George's Episcopal Church, Washington, D.C. Um, tonight will be a special program um, honoring women saints, men saints, and clergy saints. And will be a mixture of oratory and song. Please enjoy. seven decades, I was known for my portrayal of strong African-American women. Early in my career, I garnered attention and acclaim for my performance in Sounder. Then I won two Emmy Awards for my role in the television film, The Autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. I always made it clear that I would only participate in projects that portray black people with dignity. That said, I earned three Emmys, a Tony, and many accolades from civil rights and women's groups. I was named a Kennedy Center honoree, and I received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest civilian honor in this United States. Then, in 2020, I was inducted into the Television Hall of Fame. I spoke my truth about who I was and what I stood for. And on Thursday, January 28th, at the age of 96, I moved on. Two days after my memoir, Just As I Am, was released. My dedication to redefining what it means to be a black author left an everlasting mark on the world. That's why I, Cicely Tyson, want you to remember these words of mine. I done my best. And if each person in this world would simply take a small piece of this huge thing, this amazing quilt, and work it regardless of the color of the yarn, we will have harmony on this planet. Hi, I am the House Minority Leader for the Georgia General Assembly and State Representatives for the 89th House District. I am the first woman to lead either party in the assembly and the first African American to lead the House of Representatives. I am recognized nationally as one of 12 rising legislators to watch. One of the 100 most influential Georgians, legislator of the year, public service of the year, on environmental leader, leader, leader and environmental leader, champion of, for Georgia cities. I received two national awards for the outstanding legal contributions and another for public service. I am also a Harry S. Truman Scholar. 
an inductee into the Academy Women's Achievers and have been noted for one of 25 powerful women to watch. I am recognized as one of Georgia's rising super lawyers, named one of the 30 leaders of the future by Ebony Magazine. Under the pen name of Selena Montgomery, I am an award-winning author of eight romantic suspense novels which have sold more than 100,000 copies. I received a JD from Yale Law School, a master's from the University of Texas, and a bachelor from Spelman College, graduated magnum cum laude. I, Stacy Abram, took a small piece of this huge thing, this amazing quilt, and worked it regardless of the color beyond to have harmony on this planet. I am a black architect and the second child of black architect Albert Cassell. In 1943, I graduated as the valedictorian of Dunbar High School here in DC. I was then encouraged by my father to attend Cornell University College of Architecture, Art, and Planning, from where I attained a Bachelor of Science in Architecture in 1948. My sister, Alberta Jeanette Cassell, and I were the first two black women to graduate with a Bachelor of Architecture from Cornell University. From 1949 to 1951, I worked for an architectural firm in St. Louis, Missouri. After that, I worked with architect Philip Herbert Froman at the firm Froman Rob and Little in DC. Later, since I had expertise in Gothic architecture, I became the chief restoration architect for the Cathedral of St. Peter and St. Paul, known as the Washington National Cathedral. I worked on the project from 1959 to 1968, and I was the only woman architect on the team responsible for completing the project. I, Martha Ann Cassell Thompson, done my best. I took a small piece of this huge thing, this amazing quilt, and worked it regardless of the color of the yarn to have harmony on this planet. I was born Nance Leggins Cox in 1813 in Kaskaskia, Illinois, into the household of Colonel Thomas Cox. Ironically, I was born a slave in the capital of a supposed free territory. I had my case appealed to a state Supreme Court three times before Abraham Lincoln successfully argued for my freedom using the same Jeffersonian principle he later signed into law, that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist in the state of Illinois and later in the entire United States and its territories. In previous court attempts to gain my personal liberty, the verdict read, a servant is a possession and can be sold. Abraham Lincoln argued Article 6 of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. No less than three times in court, the decision was written by Supreme Court Justice Sidney Brees and established two basic and sweeping precedents that reversed my previous case and uh, other slavery verdicts. It is a presumption of law in the state of Illinois, that every person is free without regard to color, and therefore the sale of a free person is illegal. My appeal process, one of the longest in mid 19th century courts, lasted five years from 1836 to 1841. In that time, I married a free black 
Benjamin Costley, just after Abraham Lincoln agreed to take the case. By the time my emancipation occurred in July 1841, I had three children who were forever freed from indentured servitude. Thus, my children and I became the first four of what eventually became four million slaves freed by the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution. I, Nancy Leggins Costley, done my best. I took a small piece of this huge thing, this amazing quilt, and worked it regardless of the color of the yarn to have harmony on this planet. In 1951, I visited the Johns Hopkins Hospital, complaining of vaginal bleeding. Upon examination, a large malignant tumor was discovered on my cervix. At the time, Johns Hopkins Hospital was one of only a few that treated poor African Americans. There I received radium treatments. Then a sample of my cancer cells retrieved during a biopsy were sent to the lab of cancer and virus research doctor, George Gay. For years, he had collected cells from patients who came to Johns Hopkins with cervical cancer. But each of those samples quickly died in his lab. However, it was discovered that my cancer cells, unlike any others, doubled every 20 to 24 hours. After my death in 1951, Gay started a cell line for my sample by isolating one specific cell and repeating, repeatedly dividing it so that the same cell could be used for conducting many experiments. They became known as the HeLa cells because Gay's standard method for labeling samples was to use the first two letters of the patient's first and last names. Today, these cells are used to study the effects of toxins drugs, hormones, and viruses on the growth of cancer cells without experimenting on humans. They have been used around the world to test the effects of radiation and poisons, to study the human genome, to learn more how viruses work, and played a crucial role in the development of the polio vaccine and for medical research and AIDS treatments. In March 2013, researchers published the DNA sequence of the genome of a strain of HeLa cells. My family discovered this and objected to that information being available to the public. Neither my family or I gave permission to harvest my cells, yet they were used in medical research for commercial purposes. And in the 1980s, family medical records were published without family consent. My cells have made an immeasurable impact on science and have touched countless lives around the world. In 2020, I was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. In 2021, the Henrietta Lacks Enhancing Cancer Research Act of 2019 became law. It states the Government Accountability Office must complete a study about barriers to participation that exist in cancer clinical trials that are federally funded for populations that have been underrepresented. I, Henrietta Lacks, took a small piece of this huge thing, this amazing quilt, and worked it regardless of the color of the yarn to have harmony on this planet. I was the first African-American woman to lead a major public transit agency, a native of Teaneck, New Jersey, I grew up in Washington, D.C. and graduated from Howard University. I later earned a master's degree from American University. I began government service as a typist and rose to acting director of civil rights at the United States Transportation Department. There, I helped to make it possible for Coast Guard women to be allowed to serve on shipboard. In 1977, I became Chief of Administration at Metro. In 1983, I became an act, acting general manager of Metro, and two months later, 
general manager. I won praise for running what was then the nation's second largest rail and fourth largest bus transit system. During my seven year tenure at Metro, I navigated political and financial obstacles to expand Metro from 42 miles and 47 stations to 73 miles and 63 stations. Moreover, ridership gained to 70 million passengers annually. In 1988, Metro was named the nation's best transportation system by the American Public Transit Association. As the first African-American woman to head a major European transit system, I was named Washingtonian of the Year in 1986. In 1989, the American Public Transit Association awarded me with the Transit Manager of the Year distinction. I then and became under secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. There, I conduct a comprehensive reorganization study of the Smithsonian, fought for equal opportunity programs, prioritized attracting more culturally diverse audience, and worked to make more welcoming space for teenagers. In 1995, a memorial in my honor was dedicated at the Smithsonian Metro Station. Carmen Turner, I took a small piece of this huge theme, this amazing quilt, and work it regardless of the color of the yarn to have harmony on this planet. Hello. It's a new day. I'm an American singer, songwriter, musician, arranger, and civil rights activist. My music span a broad, broad range of musical styles, including classic, jazz, blues, folk, R&B, gospel, and pop. I initially inspired to be a concert pianist, and with the help of a few supporters, I enrolled in the Juilliard School of Music. Later, I applied for a scholarship to study in the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia, but I was denied admission despite well-received audition. I attributed this to racial discrimination. Yet in 2003, just days before my death, the, that institution awarded me an honorary degree. I make a living, I play, to make a living, I played piano at a nightclub in Atlanta City. I changed my name to Nina Simone. To disguise myself from family members, having chosen to play the devil's music or a so-called cocktail piano. Moreover, I was told there, that there was, would have to seem to my own accomplishment, which effectively launched my career as a jazz vocalist. I went on to record more than 40 albums. My style fused gospel and pop with classical music and accompanied ex expressive jazz-like singing with my contralto voice. I am regarded as one of the most influential recording artists of the 20th century. My composition of Mississippi Gotham broke the mold from the norm of the industry and produced direct social com commentary in my music. In naming me the 29th greatest singer of all time, Rolling Stone wrote that my honey-coated, honey slightly annoyed, annoyed cry was one of the most affecting voice of the civil rights movement. All Music's Mark Demon wrote that I am one of the most gifted vocalists of my generation and also one of the most eclectic. 
in 1970, Maya Angela wrote that I am loved or feared, adored or disliked. I, Nina Simone, took a small piece of this huge thing, this amazing quilt, and worked it regardless of the color of the yarn and have harmony on this planet. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples, and I will give praises to you among the nations. Psalm 108, verse 3. Reverend Canon Paula E. Clark. I was recently elected the 13th Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Chicago. I will be the first black person and the first woman to hold the position. I currently serve as Canon to the Ordinary and Chief of Staff in the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. I was baptized into the Episcopal Church at age 10 by Bishop John Walker, the first black dean of Washington National Cathedral and the first black bishop of the Diocese of Washington. I received my undergraduate education at Brown University and earned a Master of Public Policy degree from the University of California in Berkeley. Before entering the seminary, I served as a public information officer for the office of the mayor and the District of Columbia's Board of Parole, and served also as a Director of Human Resources and Administration for an engineering and consulting firm in the district. I received a Master of Divinity from the Virginia Technical Theological and Seminary. I served at St. Patrick's Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C., and at St. John's Episcopal Church in Beltsville, Maryland, before joining the staff of Bishop Marianne Edgar Buddy. My work for the diocese focused initially on clergy development and multicultural and justice issues. I will be consecrated 
on April 24th, 2021, as bishop of a diocese that includes 122 congregations and more than 31,000 members in northern, central, and southwestern Illinois. I am the Reverend Canon Rosemarie Logan Duncan. I joined the cathedral in 2016 as the first African-American canon for worship. And I am the first African-American woman to serve in this role. Utilizing my background as a liturgist, administrator, musician, and pastor, I am responsible for all aspects of the cathedral's worship life, which include approximately 2,000 services each year. Formerly, I was the senior associate rector at St. Columbus Episcopal Church. A native Washingtonian and cradle Episcopalian, I earned my BS, MS, and PhD from Howard University. Then, a MD Div and D Men from Virginia Theological Cemetery, VTS. Prior to ordination, I founded and directed both the Voices of Praise Choir at St. George's Episcopal Church and the contemporary Sacred Singers at VTS. I worked as a researcher for Walter Reed's Department of Behavioral Biology and as a clinical psychologist for DC General Hospital and the DC Department of Mental Health Services. I am a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and the DC Federation of Musicians. The Reverend Phoebe A. Rolfe. I was ordained and consecrated as the fourth bishop of the Diocese of West Tennessee last May. I then became the first woman and the first African American bishop in that diocese's 36 year history. Presiding Bishop Michael Curry led the service as the chief consecrator and I was formally welcomed and seated at St. Mary's Cathedral in Memphis. Prior to election, I was a seminarian at St. George's in DC. The rector of and the rector of St. Philip's the oldest African-American church in the Episcopal Diocese of Virginia, a position I held since 2011. I'm a lifelong Episcopalian who grew up in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. I received my bachelor's degree from Harvard University and a master of public administration from Princeton University. I later received a law degree from the University of Arkansas in Little Rock and a clerk for a federal judge for two years before practicing law in New Orleans. I attended Virginia Theological Seminary where I was vice chair of the Board of Trustees. I am John Thomas Walker. I was Bishop of Washington, D.C. from 1977 to 1989 in the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. And I also served as Dean of Washington National Cathedral. Previously, I was Bishop Coadjutor from 1976 to 1977 and Bishop Suffolkin from 1971 to 1976. I was the first African-American Bishop of Washington. Born in Barnesville, Georgia and raised in Detroit, I was the first African-American to be admitted as a student to the Virginia Theological Seminary in 1951. I first came to Washington as the canon of Washington National Cathedral. I had a reputation for social activism and was a good friend of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I was even arrested once at a protest rally against apartheid at the South African Embassy. I also served as president of the Board of Directors of AfriCare, which now presents the Bishop John T. Walker Distinguished Humanitarian Service Award each year in my honor. In honor of my contributions as the first African-American Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, D.C., the Bishop John T. Walker School opened in September 2008 as a tuition-free 
kindergarten through sixth grade school for boys in Southeast Washington, D.C. It was founded by the Episcopal Diocese of Washington in response to the serious educational challenges facing African-American boys in the low-income com communities east of the Anacostia River. Also named after me is the Bishop John T. Walker Learning Center in Washington, D.C., whose mission is to support, encourage, and facilitate lifelong learning to all people through instruction, dialogue, exploration, humor interactions, and exchanges. I now rest in peace in the Washington National Cathedral. I am the Reverend Dr. John Carlton Hayden. I consider myself a priest, educator, and historian. Born in Bowling Green, Kentucky in 1933, I have been active in church education, leadership, and social justice issues for many years. After my ordination in 1963, I served in Canada as the honorary assistant at St. James and Regina as the chaplain of the University of Virginia. I transferred back to the United States in 1971 and served at various parishes in Washington, Maryland, including St. George's and St. Luke's. Beyond parish ministry, much of my work has been devoted to documenting the history of African Americans in the church and advocating for equality, respect, and fair treatment. Throughout the 1970s, I was involved with African American and social issues. I served on the board of the National Council of Churches, the Union of Black Episcopalians, and on the Diocese of Maryland's Commission for Black Ministry. My main contributions to the church and society are as an educator and historian. I was the assistant professor of history at Howard University an adjunct professor of church history at Virginia Theological Seminary, and later associate dean at the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee, School of Theology. A historian and author, I have written many books and articles on African-American church, history, and social issues. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Galatians 5 verse 1. and civil rights leader, my life was devoted to protecting and advancing the rights of black people in the United States. 
I played several roles in the civil rights movement to end racial segregation in the United States. Those roles included my being beaten and arrested as a freedom rider in the early 1960s. And as chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, I was one of the big six leaders who organized the March on Washington with Dr. King. Then I spent almost four decades championing the causes of marginalized communities as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives for Georgia's 5th Congressional District. In my last years, I worked to get the Voting Rights Event Advancement Act enacted into law as a way to guarantee every American's right to vote. That right was compromised by the Supreme Court's Shelby County versus Holder decision in 2013. I have said this before and I will say it again. The vote is precious. It is almost sacred. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool we have in a democracy. I received many national and international awards, including the highest civilian award of the United States, the Presidential Medal Freedom from President Barack Obama. Of my many quotes that provide perspective and inspiration for the fight for social justice, perhaps the most impactful one that signifies the way I live my life is, get in good trouble, necessary trouble, and help redeem the soul of America. Well, I, John Lewis, got in good trouble, necessary trouble, and I helped redeem the soul of America. My name is Hammer, or Hammer and Hank, and I am an American professional baseball right fielder who played 23 seasons in Major League Baseball. My career, home runs broke the long-standing Record, for, record set by Babe Ruth and stood as the most for 33 years. I am one of only two players to hit 30 or more home runs in a season at least 15 times. In 1982, I was inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in my first year of eligibility. I appeared briefly in the Negro American League and in minor league baseball before starting my major league career. By my final major league baseball season, I was the last Negro League baseball player on a major league roster. During my time in the major leagues, and especially during my run for, for the hitting record, my family and I endured extensive racist threats. I was a National League All-Star for 20 seasons, an American League All-Star for one, the record holder for the most All-Star selections, and I share the record for most All-Star games played with Willie Mays and Stan Musial. I was a three-time Gold Glove winner, and in 1957, I won the National League's Most Valuable Player Award. I continue to hold the Major League Baseball records for the most career runs batted in, 2,297, extra base hits, 1,477, and total bases, 6,856. I am in second place in home runs, 755, and at, at bats, 12,364. And in third place in games played, 3,298. At the time of my retirement, I held most of the game's key career power hitting records. I was inducted into the Wisconsin Athletic Hall of Fame in 1988 and awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2002. I transitioned from this life to the next on January 22nd, 2021. I got in good trouble, necessary trouble, and I helped redeem the soul of America. Born in Mobile, Alabama, and raised in Thomasville, Georgia, I am a retired U.S. 
States Army four-star general and the first African-American to serve as U.S. Defense Secretary. I graduated from West Point with a Bachelor of Science degree. Later, I earned a Master of Arts from Auburn University and a Master of Business Administration from Webster University. I was commissioned as a second lieutenant after graduating from West Point, and my initial assignment was to the 3rd Infantry Division, mechanized in Germany. I am also a graduate of the Infantry Officer Basic and Advanced Courses, the Army Command and General Staff College, and the Army War College. I further, further served as the 33rd Vice Chief of Staff of the Army and the last Commanding General of the United States Forces. Iraq Operation New Dawn. In 2013, I was appointed as the first black commander of CENTCOM by President Barack Obama. I retired from the Army services in 2016 and joined the boards of Raytheon Technologies, Nucor, and Tenton Healthcare. My awards and decorations include three Distinguished Service Medals, a Silver Star, a Legion of Merit, a Defense Meritorious Service Medal, Meritorious Service Medal, Joint Service Commendation Medal, Army Commendation Medal, Army Achievement Medal, Army Presidential Unit Citation, Joint Meritorious Unit Award, Secretary's Distinguished Service Award, Department of State National Def Defense Service Medal, Armed For Forces Expeditionary Medal, Afghanistan Campaign Medal, Iraq Campaign Medal, Global War on Terrorism Expeditionary Medal, Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, Humanitarianism, Humanitarian Service Medal, Army Service Ribbon, and an Army Overseas Ribbon. I, Lloyd Austin, get in good trouble, necessary trouble. I am helping to redeem the soul of America. I am a re Republican U.S. Senator and Minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church and a college administrator. Born free in North Carolina, I later lived and worked in Ohio where I voted before the Civil War. During the American Civil War, I helped organize two regiments of the United States Colored Troops, served as a Union Army chaplain in Mississippi and established schools for freed slaves in Missouri. After that, I was appointed to the United States Senate as a Republican to represent Mississippi in 1870 and 1871 during the Reconstruction era. Thus, I became the first African American to serve in the United States Congress. After that brief service as the first black senator, I was appointed first president of Alcorn Agricultural and Mechanical College now Alcorn State University. After that, I served again as a minister. I championed education for black Americans, spoke out against racial segregation, and fought against efforts to undermine the civil and political rights of African Americans. 151 years ago, in February of 1870, I took my oath of office as the first African American to serve in the United States Congress. Just 22 days before that, the 15th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified, prohibiting states from disenfranchising voters on account of race, color, previous or previous condition of servitude. So I was dubbed the 15th Amendment in flesh and blood. I, Harem Rhodes Rebel, got in good trouble. 
necessary trouble. And I help redeem the soul of America. I was born in Washington, D.C. and attended D.C. public schools, which were segregated at the time. In 1943, I interrupted my studies at Minus Teachers College to serve in World War II. On D-Day, June 6, 1944, as a Sergeant Major, I was one of the heroes who helped defeat Nazi oppression by storming Normandy, braving Nazi machine guns and bombs. For this, I was awarded the Bronze Star and the Croix de Gaurier. Moreover, I rose to be a sergeant major, the highest rank possible for an enlisted soldier. After the war, I completed my education and began an 18-year career teaching social studies at what was then Banneker Junior High. In 1964, I was elected president of Local 6, American Federation of Teachers, later called Washington Teachers Union. I served as president for a total of 25 years. Under my leadership, DC teachers won many victories. Compensation became more equal with other professions requiring college degrees. More on the job equality for women occurred. Rights for temporary teachers were realized, as well as the right for teachers to access their own personal files. And the policy of triking students diminished. I fought for the right of every DC student to receive the education they needed to succeed. My affiliation with St. George's began at an early age when I attended Sunday school with my siblings. In 1948, Elaine and I married at St. George's and we supported the church mission in many ways. My wife, my daughters, and I felt gratitude the love and prayers of St. George's family as offered through the various seasons of life. Roles of my, my retirement years included college lecturer, writer, consultant. In 1995, I was appointed treasurer of the Association for the Study of African, African Life and History, which was founded by the legendary historian Carter G. Woodson. I, as the first president of the Washington Teachers Union, I, William H. Simon, got in good trouble, necessary trouble, and I helped redeem the soul of America. As a Superior Court judge, I was known for my self-mockering humor, affable nature, and jewel greetings to many throughout the courthouse corridors. I was born on a farm in Meebane, North Carolina. In 1929, I won a football scholarship to Howard University. I graduated with a BS from Howard and received a law degree from Terrell College. I served in the Army during World War II. After that, I began a career in the legal field. I was among the first black lawyers granted membership to the DC Bar Association. In 1965, President Lyndon Johnson summoned me to the White House and asked if I had tax problems that might jeopardize my nomination to the city council. I said no, because I never made any money. I then became one of the nine council members to serve in the first appointed city council in the days before home rule. Later, President Richard Nixon appointed me Associate Judge of the Court of General Sessions. In member St. George's, I was among the first to welcome Pamela Cox Alexander here to worship. Her dad, James Cox, was my friend, fellow Howard and Terrell Law grad, fellow DC Bar, National Bar and Urban League member, and fellow Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity brother. As a judge and prize president of the DC Bar Association, the National Bar Association, and the Washington Urban League, I took Thompson. 
got in good trouble, necessary trouble, and I helped redeem the soul of America. I am a pastor and politician now serving as a senator in the United States from Georgia. I am the first African American elected to the Senate seat in Georgia. I served as a senior pastor of Douglas Memorial Community Church until 2005, when I became a senior pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. I came to prominence in Georgia politics as a leading activist in the campaign to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. In wanting to follow in the footsteps of Martin Luther King Jr., I attended Morehouse College and graduated cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology. Then I earned a Master of Divinity, Master of Philosophy, and Doctor of Philosophy degrees from Union Theological Seminary. In the 1990s, I served as a youth pastor and then assistant pastor at Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York. In the 2000s, I was senior pastor at Douglas Memorial Community Church in Baltimore, Maryland. In 2005, I became senior pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, which is Martin Luther King Jr.'s former congregation. And I plan to continue in the post while serving in the Senate. In 2013, I delivered the benediction at the public prayer service at the second inauguration of Barack Obama. I, Raphael Warnock, get in good trouble, necessary trouble. I am helping redeem the soul of America. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. Psalm 148, verse 13. Way that 
that with tears has been watered. We have come treading a path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, where the bright beam of our bright star is cast. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who hast brought us thus far on the way, Thou who hast by Thy might led us into the light, keep us forever on the path. Grace to you and peace. I am the Reverend Marilyn Jenkins, priest in charge of St. George's Episcopal Church. Thank you for joining St. George's for our Litany of Black Saints. What a wonderful way to honor all those men, women, and clergy who have worked to have harmony on this planet and help redeem the soul of America. I want to give a special thanks to the St. George's Music and Arts Committee and all those who helped the committee make this video possible, especially those who availed themselves to be filmed. And to our two musicians, Pam Alexander and James McKinney, as well as Juanita Williams for singing. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the litany and music.